from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios for a CUBE Conversation. We're excited to have a, a many time CUBE alumni. He's been at all types of companies. He's moving around. We like to, to keep him close because he's got a great feel for what's going on. And now he's starting a new adventure. Uh, so really happy to welcome Alan Cohen back to the studio. Alan, great to see you. Hey Jeff, how are you? In your new adventure, let's get it right. It's the DCVC, your partner. So this is a... I'm on the venture side, I've gone to the dark side. You've gone to the dark side of the yeah. money side, but it's this is not side. a new light firm. Light side is the dark side, yeah. So what's special about this ton of money in venture right now, but you guys kind of have a special thesis, so tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, and I think you've spoken to Matt and Zach, uh, you know, my partners in the past. So uh, DCVC has been in the venture business for about a decade. And, um, it, you know, the first five years of the fund was very much focused on building a lot of the infrastructure that we kind of take for granted now, things that have gone into VMware and into Citrix and into AWS, and hence the data collect of the DC okay. side of DCVC. Really, uh, the focus of the, the, the firm in the last five years and, and going forward is in an area that we call deep tech, which think about more about the intersection of science and engineering. So less about how do you improve the IT infrastructure, but how do you take all this computational power and put it to work in, in specific industries, whether it's addressing supply chains, new forms of manufacturing, new forms of agriculture. So we're starting to see all that, all the stuff that we've built out over right. the last 20 years and really apply it against kind of industrial transformation. So, and we're excited, we just raised a $725 million fund. Yeah. So we've got a little bit of ammunition to work with. Congratulations, so it's, it's fund five, it's your eighth fund. Yeah. And really it's consistent with where we're seeing all the time about applied AI and applied machine learning. Exactly right. It's not right. a generic AI company that's going to build AI, it's more the where are you applying AI within an application? Where are you applying machine learning within what you do? And then you can just see the applications grow. Exactly right, yeah. So are you targeting specific companies that are attacking a particular industrial focus and just using AI as their secret sauce or using deep tech as their secret uh, sauce? All of the above, Okay. right? So like I, when I think about DCVC, like it's like, so don't think about um, IOPS um, or throughput or bandwidth, uh, think about, um, um, uh, rockets, robots, microbes, um, building blocks of, of effectively of, of human life right. and, and of materials, and then applying computational power and AI against um, those areas. Um, so a little bit, uh, you know, different focus. So, you know, it's the intersection of compute, you know, really smart computer science. Right, right. But I'll give you a great example and, uh, of something that'll be a little bit different. So we are investors and uh, very active in a company called Pivot Bio, uh, which is not exactly a household name. Pivot Bio is a company that is replacing chemical fertilizer with microbes. And what I mean by that is they create microbes, they use, so they've used all this big data and AI and computational power to construct microbes that when you plant corn, you insert the microbe into the planting cycle and it continuously produces nitrogen which means you don't have to apply fertilizer. Right. Um, which fertilizer today in the US is $212 billion industry. Um, and two things happen. One, you don't have all of the runoff, doesn't leach into the ground, the nitrous does, the nitrogen doesn't go into the air, and the crop yield has been, been, been between about 12 and 15% higher. Right. So, so it's interesting yeah. though, is, is the getting put, you know, the food industry is, is such a great place mm -hmm. and there's so many opportunities both in food production. This is like beyond chemical fertilizer instead of beyond meat. No, but it's meat. great, yeah. but it's funny because you think yeah. of GMO, right? So yeah. all food is genetically modified. It's just, it took a long time in the past because you had to get trees together and you had to yeah. replant the, the pretty apples and throw the old apple trees away. Because if you look at an apple today versus an apple 50 years, 100 years ago, right. they're very, very different. And yet when we apply a man-made kind of acceleration to that process, then people you know, kind of push back, whoa, this is, this is not, this is not nature. So I'm just curious in, 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 in well, this, this like the microbe, you know, yes, and it, it actually is. it is nature, right? So it uh, is nature, but there'll be some crazy person that says, wait, this is not, you know, you're introducing some foreign element into this. Well, into this process. you could take potash and pour it on corn, right? Or you could create a use a microbe that creates nitrogen. So which one is the uh, 
chemical and which one is nature. Right, that, right? that's what I think it's, yeah. it's, it's a funny part of that conversation. But, 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 but it's a knowledge. different area, so right. you, you guys, look, you guys spend a lot of time on the road, you talk to a lot of startups, you talk to a lot of companies, you actually talk to venture capitalists, and most of the time we're, you know, we're working on the $4 trillion IT sector, not an insignificant sector, right? right, right. So that's globally, it's, that's about the size of the economy. You know, manufacturing, agriculture, and um, healthcare is more like 20 to 40 billion dollars of the economy. So what we've also done is open the aperture to areas that have not gone through the technical disruption that we've seen in IT right. now in these industries. And that's what's, I mean, that's why I joined the firm, and that's why I'm really excited because on one hand, you're right, there is a lot of capital, you mentioned when we were talking before, there is a lot of capital in venture, but there's not as much targeted at these areas. So you have a larger part of global economy and then a much more specific focus on it. Yeah, I think it's, it's such a, you know, it's kind of the futures here, kind of the concept, because no one knows you know, the rate of which tech is advancing across all industries currently. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you wake up one day and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, look at the impacts on transportation, look at the impacts on construction, right. look at the impacts on healthcare, look at the impacts on, on agriculture. So the opportunity is fantastic and still following the basic ideas of democratizing data, not using a sample of old data, but using, you know, real-time analytics on whole data sets, you know, all these kind of concepts that come over really, really well to a more commercial application than an IT application. Yeah, so Jeff, I'm kind of like looking over your shoulder and I'm looking at Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat, and, you know, if we think about all of us who've been kind of working on the internet for the last 20 years, we've done some amazing things, like we've democratized information, right? Google is a fairly powerful part of our lives. We've been able to allow people to buy things from all over the world and ship it. So we've done a lot of amazing things in the economy, but it hasn't been free. So if I need a 2032 CR2232 battery for my key fob for my phone and I buy it from Amazon and it comes in a big box, well, there's a little bit of a carbon footprint issue that goes with that. So one of our key focuses in DCBC, which I think is very unique, is we think two things can happen is that we can deal with some of the excesses um, of the economy that we've built um, and as well as you know unlock really large profit pools at the end of the day you know it has the word venture but it also has the word capital right and right. so we have you know limited partners they expect returns we're doing this obviously to, to build large franchises so this is not um, like this kind of uh, political social thing is that we have large parts of the economy that are not sustainable and I'll give you some examples actually you know Jeff Bezos put out a pledge um, last week to try to figure out how to turn Amazon carbon neutral pretty amazing thing right you know from the was the richest person now the happiest richest person in the world right <laughs> uh, but somebody who's completely transformed the consumer economy right as well as computing economy right. And soon transportation. Right, so people like us are saying, hey, how can we help Jeff meet his pledge, right? And like, you know, there are things that we work on, like, you know, next generation of nuclear plants. Like, you know, we need renewables, we need solar, but there's no way to replace electricity, the amount of electricity we're going right. to need to run our economy and move off of coal and natural gas. Right, so you know, being able to deal with the climate impacts, the uh, social impacts, um, are going to be actually some of the largest economic opportunities. Like you can look at it and say, "Hey, this is a terrible problem. It's ripping people across." I got caught in a traffic jam in San Francisco yesterday, um, up on the top of the hill because there was a climate protest. Right, 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 and you know, so I'm I'm not kind of judging the politics of that. We can have a long conversation about that. The question is, how do you deal? with these real issues, right? And, right? and obviously, and how do you deal with them profitably and ethically? And I think that's something that's very unique um, about you know, DCVC's focus and the ability to raise probably the largest deep tech fund ever to go after it means that you know, a lot of people who back us also see the economic opportunity, right? At the end of the day, there, you know, a lot of our, um, our limited partners are pension funds, you know, in universities like, you know, there was a professor who has a pension fund who's got to retire, 
right? So a little right. bit of that money goes into DCVC, so we have a responsibility to provide a return to them, as well as go after these very interesting opportunities. So is there any very specific kind of investment thesis or industry focus or, you know, kind of yeah. subset within, you know, heavy lifting te uh, technology and science and math? That's a real loaded question. I'll try to unpack <laughs> it a little. So um, we like problems that can be solved through massive computational capabilities. Okay. And so, and that reflects our heritage and where we all came from, right? You and I and folks in the industry. So, you know, we're not working at the intersection of, of lab science at, at a university but we would take something like that and invest in it. So we like, you know, we have a lot of investments in agriculture, in healthcare. Uh, we are surprisingly one of the largest investors in space. Um, we have investments in Rocket Labs, which is the preferred launch vehicle for any small satellite under two and a half kilograms. We are large investors in Planet Labs, which is a constellation of 200 small satellites. Uh, we're investors in Capella Space. So. Uh, we, you know, we like space and, you know, it's not space for the sake of space. It's like, it's about geospatial intelligence, right? So, you know, Planet Labs is effectively the search engine for the planet Earth, right? I mean, it's effectively Google for the planet right, Earth. Right, right. And all that information could be fed to deal with housing, with transportation, with climate change. Um, it could be used with economic activity, with shipping. So, you know, we like those kinds of areas where that technology can really impact an industry. So, and so we're not limited, um, but you know, we also have a bio fund. So we, we have, you know, we like, you know, we like agriculture instead of, instead of synthetic biology types of investments. And you know, we still invest in things like cyber. Um, we invest in physical security. We're investors in Evolve, which is the lead system for dealing with active shooters and venues, as well as Fordham, which is a drone security company. So, um, but they're all built on AI and massive, and massive computational, computational, computational power. I'm just curious, you probably don't have an investment in it, but I'm sure you have a point of view, because you got a point of view of most everything on quantum. <laughs> you know, we just hear all this little buzz about quantum. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Accenture opened up their new innovation hub in the uh -huh. Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, and they've got this little dedicated kind of quantum computer quantum computer space and you know regardless of how close it is you know there's some really interesting computational opportunities slash challenges that we think will come with some period of time so we have quantum yeah. and encryption and I'd love so to we have multiple there. quantum investments we're in, uh, one of the lead investors in Rigetti computing okay um, and in control Q down in Australia so no we like quantum now quantum is a emerging area like it, it's we're not quite at the x86 level right, of right. quantum we have a little bit of work to get there um, but it offers some amazing you know capabilities one thing that also I think differentiates us and I was listening um, to what you're saying is we're not afraid to go long I mean a lot of our investments are going to be between 7 and 15 years and I think that's also it's very different if you follow the basic economics and venture, most funds are expected to be about 10 years right. old, right? And in the first three or four years, you do the um, bulk of the preliminary investing and then you have reserves for, for additional, problems. you know, you know the, the big winners emerge so you can continue to support the companies. Um, some of ours are going to go longer because of what we do. And I think that's something very special um, now look, we'd like to return in the life of the fund, of course. I mean, that's right, our right. fiduciary responsibility. But I think things like quantum, some of these things in the environment, they're going to take a while. a while. And our limited partners want to be in that long ride. Now we have a thesis that they will actually be bigger economic opportunities. They'll take longer. So by having a dedicated team, dedicated focus um, in those areas, um, that gives us, I think, a unique advantage. Um, one, one of the things when we were launching the fund that we realized is we, pro we have more people that have published um, scientific papers and started companies than MBAs um, in the firm. So, yeah. it's, so we are a little bit, you know, we're a little geekier that way. That's good. Uh, <laughs> I was at a party one time and I was talking to this guy yeah, we're not the best people it, at parties. We know, yeah, but it, but yeah. it's funny. The guy was he was a VC in medical 
medical tech. And I just yeah. asked him, like, so are you like a doctor? Did you work at a yeah. hospital? Or you worked at a at a university that does, you know, you know, I was an investment banker on Wall Street. I'm like, oh, that's something, <laughs> that's something yeah. you know how to make money move. But, you know, do you have the do you have the real world experience of being in the trenches where some of these applications are are are, are being used? But I'm also curious, where do you guys like to come in? A, B, C. Where, what's your uh, what's well, your sweet spot? Traditionally, we are, have been a seed and Series A investor. We like to be early. Okay. And you and like to lead or follow on? Uh, everybody likes to lead, right? Right, right, right. You know, but Set you that have term sheet. You know, uh, yeah, right. And, and you have to learn how to. Sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow. So we, you know, we we do both. Okay. Uh, there are increasing as because of the size of the fund, we will have the opportunity to be a little bit more multi-stage than we traditionally are known for doing. It's like, for example, we were seed investors in little companies like Confluent. In Elastic, that worked out okay, but we were not later stage right. investors in company like companies like that. Uh, with the new fund, we're more likely to also be in the later stages as well for some of the big banks. But we love seed, we love pre-seed. Uh, we like three guys and a dog, right? If they have a brilliant- It's tough though to put 750 to work when you're investing in the three guys and a dog, unless it's well, the one that runs and runs and runs. You know, you, we, we do things we call experiments. Okay. We'll just, you know, uh, we also have a very unique asset uh, we don't talk about publicly. We have a lot of really brilliant people around the firm that we call equity partners. So there's about 60 leading um, scientists and executives around the world who are also attached to the firm. They actually are, have a financial stake in the firm who work with us. That gives us the ability to be early. Now clearly, if you put in a $250,000 seed investment, you don't put in the same amount of time necessarily. Right as if you just wrote a $12 million check. What's interesting, that's the traditional wisdom. I find we actually work out just as hard on those. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, have any, do you have any formal relationships with any academic institutions? How does that work? Well, we, I mean, look, we work like everybody else with Stanford and MIT. I mean, we have uh, many universities who are limited partners in the fund. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of, so we um, helped put together a company in Canada called Element AI, which actually just raised $150 million. And they, the founder of that company is, a uh, co-founder is a fellow named Yashua Bengio. Um, he was Jeff Hinton's PhD student, him and Eva Lacun. These are the guys who invented neural networking and AI. And this company was built out of Yashua's position at the University of Montreal. There's 125 um, PhDs in AI that work at this firm. Wow. And so we're obviously deeply involved now right. with the Montreal AI scene. By the way, Montreal is one of the best AI scenes in the world and cool food. Didn't know and, that. Oh yeah. And well, because of Yashua, because everybody came out of his lab. Right, right. So I think, yes, yeah, so I think, uh, so you know, we've worked with Carnegie Mellon. We work with, so we, we do work with a lot of universities. I, what I would say is universities work with multiple venture firms. Right. Um, it's so, such an important pipeline for really smart, heavy duty. Totally. Math and tech yeah. tech guys. All it's right. Smarter than me, that's for sure, <laughs> yeah. You always want to, you never want to be the smartest guy in the room, right? Uh, or yeah. you're in the wrong room is what they say. Uh, you know, so there's probably an equivalent in venture. They always say you, you should buy the smallest house in the best neighborhood. Exactly. I, I was able to squeeze into DCVCs. I'm like the least smart technical guy in the smartest technical neighborhood. There you go, that's the way yeah. to go. All right, Alan, well thanks for stopping by and we look forward to, uh, to you bringing some of these exciting new investment uh, companies inside theCUBE. Great, thanks for the time. All right, he's Alan, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE, we're in our Palo Alto studios. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.